Netflix is determined to ruin one of the greatest television shows in television history. Good times. One of the greatest memories of my childhood. Netflix has a cartoon that makes a mockery of one of the most family-friendly, uplifting shows of the 1970s. They've made a mockery of it, and they're using Steph Curry to justify all the negativity directed at black people, black culture, and black families. Steph Curry will be the focus of today's episode of Fearless. We're gonna talk about Steph Curry and how he has been installed no different from Charlemagne the God, no different from Stephen A. Smith, and Kwame Brown's gonna join us to talk about it. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Oh, happy Friday to you and yours. We have an awesome episode of Fearless coming up just around the corner. If you're listening over Apple, make sure you hit that five-star rating, help us fight the algorithm. If you're watching over YouTube, hit the notifications, hit the likes, hop in the comments, leave a comment. Let's help this thing go viral. Uh, the other great thing you can do is go to blazetv.com slash fearless, use my promo code fearless, and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription to Blaze TV. It's the greatest thing you can do in support of me, this show, and the work we do here with the Fearless, ep uh, fearless Army. This episode, today's very special episode, is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my code FEARLESS to get $150 worth of free chicken wings for a year, plus $20 off your yearly subscription. BlazeTV.com, greatest thing you could do uh, for us. All right, I want to start here uh, with this conversation about the install. And I want to start, we're going to focus in initially on Steph Curry. And I know that will sound strange to you. What do you mean, Steph Curry? He's great. He's one of the, my favorite things about sports and the NBA. And he's married and he has a good family and his wife is great. And, Everything about Steph Curry is great. Jason, how can you criticize Steph Curry? He can't, he's not installed. He's got incredible talent. He's not like a Stephen A. Smith or, or a Kevin Hart or a Charlemagne the God. How, how can you do this? Well, I'm going to explain to you and show you how. The installation that Cat Williams started us talking about, we went into amazing detail last Thursday and Friday about Diddy and his role in hip hop and how everything is manipulated in hip hop. I'm gonna show you how they could take someone like Steph Curry, turn him out, install him, and use him for the exact same nihilistic agenda that I talked about last week as it relates to the music industry. I wanna play you a trailer of Netflix's new cartoon, Good Times, which I believe debuts on April 12th. I want to play you uh, this trailer, and then I'm going to explain to you how Steph Curry is being used. Let's watch the trailer. We're just as good as the Evans of old. Isn't that just dynamite? But the truth is, we're the Evans of new. You look like money. Everything, everything what about the struggle? We're black. It'll be here tomorrow. Everything black, black bird, black moon, black sky, black light, black, everything black. Wait. Did you hear the music? Everything black, everything black, everything black. They're selling you this as black culture. They're selling you this debauchery, this minstrel show, this immorality, this criminality. They're selling you, this is black. This is what black people do. This is black culture. That's what the music is there for. Obviously the visuals and the, the everything else, 
works in conjunction with that, works very great synergy with the music. The racial idolatry is there. She's playing to the black gods and her black Jesus and all this, the racial idolatry, the baby drug dealer, it, it, it's all there. And, and how are they getting away with this? Whose name did they slap on this to justify what they're doing? Steph Curry, a basketball player. What does Steph Curry, a basketball player, know about cartoons, know about television? Why is his name being used to justify this? Why is he listed first as the executive producer? He's listed first. Norman Lear is dead now, but his production company and all that stuff I'm sure lives on, but he's one of the great television producers of all time. Steph Curry is listed above him. Seth MacFarlane, one of the great entertainers. He's been involved, I think, with uh, The Simpsons and other cartoon uh, television shows. He's, he's an entertainer, one of the great entertainers of, of our lifetime. I saw him out in Vegas, saw him do a Frank Sinatra routine, just him and a microphone and a shot of whiskey and he sang and he cracked jokes and he danced, he did all, he's a great entertainer. He, he fits in it, he's written cartoons and been involved with that stuff. Steph Curry's listed above him. He's been installed where he's not qualified and he's been installed so that when they put out this Good Times show, cartoon, that totally denigrates the legacy of Good Times, which was a very family-friendly, uplifting show that didn't go over the top with it, but it had a biblical worldview. Man, woman, children, doing the best in Florida Evans, James Evans, in stealing very good values in their kids. How do we go from that? What I'm t good times was for, for, for white folks that maybe didn't or are not familiar with good times or, or maybe you're too young and you don't, but it was the happy days of the 1970s for black people. Tremendous uplifting show that humanized and portrayed uh, struggling, economically challenged black people in a positive light. How did we go from that to this? And how did they justify it? They justified it with Steph Curry. Hey, we got a basketball player that we can slap his name on this so that no one can call us racist for portraying black people as nihilistic, free of morality, and wicked and evil and radically material and violent. How can we do that? Oh, we'll slap Steph Curry's name on this. He's been installed. No different than Stephen A. Smith, no different than Charlemagne the God, no different than Diddy. He's just playing a different role. This is what they do. Steph Curry, let's remember who he is. He's the son of Dale Curry, a longtime NBA player. Long time. He's the son of parents that were married for I think the first 28 years, 30 years of Steph Curry's life, Dale and Sonya Curry have now divorced, but Steph Curry grew up in a Huxtable-like environment. Two great parents, loving parents, who had him out in some sort of suburban, gated community type area his entire life. Oh, so is that what qualifies him to be the executive producer about a black family growing up in Cabrini, Cabrini Green's projects in Chicago? Is that his special insight 
comes from growing up in the suburbs, the son of an NBA player, a devoted mother, growing two-parent home. Oh, he's the perfect guy to help us do a cartoon about black people living in the ghetto. What are his qualifications? Or does he just have the willingness to allow his name to be attached to a project like this? He's willing to be installed. He's willing to collect a check. This all attaches to the argument I was making to you guys last week. None of these people, none of them have FU money. It doesn't matter how much. Steph Curry has probably made close to $300 million just in the NBA. No telling what he's made in endorsements, shoe contract, and all that other stuff. Steph Curry's got to be worth $300 to $500 million. You would think he'd have FU money. And we'd say, nah, I ain't going to do this. You're not going to attach my name to this ghetto trash. But he doesn't have F you money. He has F me money, just like the other guys I told you about. And they're, again, they're giving all this money to athletes and paying them incredible sums of money for, in a less competitive league and, and all this because they know they can use athletes and install them and use their name, image, and likeness and use their credibility however they want. It's no different than as I told you all uh, last week. Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cents. These guys are all incredibly wealthy and allegedly have F.U. money. But if someone taps them on the shoulder, the right person says, Hey, Dre, I know you're a billionaire, but I need you to come on this TV show with Jimmy Kimmel, and I need you to pretend to be a doctor and be looking to examine Jimmy Kimmel's penis on national TV. I know you're in your 50s, I know you got kids, you probably got grandkids, I know you're worth a billion dollars, but Dre, need you to do this. And he's in no position because the money's been given to him by the puppet masters, and he went into business on their criminal enterprise of creating this toxic rap music. And so he can't tell them no. He has to say, yes sir boss, me and Snoop and 50 will be there and we will go on the hunt for Jimmy Kimmel's penis on live national TV. That's what this F me money is for and we appreciate it. Steph Curry, same situation. We want to do uh, uh, a cartoon on Netflix that makes fools of black people and further denigrates them and makes them a laughing stock. Okay, guys, you need me to do it. Put my name on it. Let me do whatever Seth MacFarlane and Norman Lear's production company have uh, come up with. I will justify it. I will clean it up. I'll make it acceptable. I'll make it so no one can accuse you of being racist. This is the exact same way it works in the music industry. BlackRock, Vanguard, The Shareholders, Liar Cohen, Jimmy Iovine, David Kenner, Jerry Heller, Clive Davis. They go into deals and partnerships with uh, black entertainers and celebrities and say, hey, we'll make you a star and you'll get all this money. And now we can put out this music that absolutely denigrates black people and promotes nihilism across the board, and no one can call us racist because Diddy, 50, Snoop, Dre, you cleaned it all up for us. We put your face, Easy e Tupac, Snoop, again, all of Biggie, we put your face on all of this. No one can say what we're doing is bigoted. We're uplifting you. Birdman, Lil Wayne, they're all doing it out of their love of black people. It's not racist. They've all been installed. I wanna, we're gonna have Kwame Brown on here 
in, in a second because I'm gonna let Kwame do a victory lap because all of this stuff we've been talking about, I, I, I started thinking about the things that uh, Kwame Brown was talking about two, three, four years ago as it relates to Stephen A. Smith when he called out Stephen A. Smith as being installed. He didn't have the perfect explanation then, but he's been justified by the research that we did here on this show and me reading Stephen A's book and like, oh my God, what Kwame's saying makes perfect sense. Stephen A. Smith, completely unqualified, has a fabricated background, never peed a drop in college basketball. He's been lying about that. He's a pathological liar. He will promote whatever message we tell him to promote. Hey, black people, go take this experimental vaccine. And if you don't, you're an idiot. He'll do that. He'll write a book that takes a major dump on his father and celebrates his mother because black women are queens and the, pat and the matriarchy is the greatest thing ever. Stephen A will write that book. He'll pretend that cops pulled him over in Troy, Michigan and the white people that were with him wouldn't give him $9 and he had to call some black woman in Atlanta to save him. He'll write all of that. He'll pretend that Big House Gaines and him are best friends. And like a father figure, he's very comfortable lying. So we will install him. Kwame Brown, I'm gonna have him on so he can gloat about being totally right about Stephen A. Smith. And people didn't fully understand where Kwame was coming from when he was criticizing Stephen A. Smith and talking about how unfair he was and talking about how the NBA was actually using Stephen A. Smith to promote a message and a narrative about high school players coming straight to the NBA. Stephen A. Smith was used, he was installed. He, he is installed, he's a voice for the establishment and for the globalist, he's there to keep, to to gatekeep and herd black people a certain direction. The other person I'm going to let uh, Kwame come on <clears throat> and gloat about is Charlemagne the Fraud, or, or as I like to call him, Charlemagne the Installed. If you remember, two or three years ago, Charlemagne came at Kwame Brown, and Kwame Brown fired shots back at Charlemagne the Fraud. And Charlemagne, for those of you who don't know, he's the host of the Breakfast Club, or one of the hosts of the Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club is, uh, it's like, for lack of a better now, it, it's for young black people, it's like what Oprah Winfrey used to be in the 1990s and 2000s. It's kind of the meeting spot, the talking spot, the, 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 the gatekeeping spot for young black people so they should know what they should think politically and about the culture. That's Charlemagne and DJ Envy, and I, I don't know who the woman is they have on now because I think the other woman left or, or got removed or whatever, but Charlemagne is a gatekeeper. And he and Kwame went back and forth years ago, and Kwame Brown was 100% right. And so I wanna play you this clip of uh, Charlemagne talking with Diddy. And keep in mind, Diddy founded Revolt TV. Uh, the Breakfast Club is uh, aired on Revolt TV. So this will be Diddy talking to Charlemagne, and, Char and Diddy is Charlemagne's boss. Let's watch them talk about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. If this man is elected, we're not standing by no more getting killed. We're not scared of anybody standing up and standing by. We're on the verge of a, a race war. White men like Trump need to be banished. That way of thinking, it's real dangerous. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, we don't have no choice. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can say what you want about Biden. I, I, I can't say I love the pick either, but hey, we got to get him in office mm -hmm. and then we got to hold him accountable. So there's Diddy, the billionaire gatekeeper, talking to one of his employees or workers or entertainers, Charlemagne, about you know, what they need to do to Donald Trump. This isn't about me defending Donald Trump. 
This is about how the gatekeepers operate. And so here's Diddy. And now think about what we know about Diddy now. Allegations of sex trafficking, allegations, lawsuits about uh, raping and drugging women and men, allegations that he uh, records, video records, everything that goes on in his house, he'd throw these big parties and he'd have entertainers and celebrities and politicians and other powerful people, executives, on tape at his house having sex with men, women, perhaps underage people. They're calling Diddy the Jeffrey Epstein of the music industry. That he used sexual compromise as leverage to control people. And he acquired information and dirt on people, used it for himself, passed it on to others so that they could manipulate and control people and keep people on message. That's our understanding of Diddy at this moment based on the allegations, based on the, uh, the, the FBI Homeland Security raids at his home, what he's being investigated for and may be charged with. That's our understanding of Diddy. So who is Charlemagne? Well, Kwame, when he got into a dust up with Charlemagne, pointed out that like, and resurfaced things that we knew that had been swept under the rug, that in 2001, at the age of 22, Charlemagne was accused of organizing a party. A 15 year old girl, Jessica Reed from South Carolina, alleges that she was drugged at this party, given a drink by Charlemagne and drugged at this party, taken upstairs uh, by two men, sexually violated by these men, and that Char her allegation is Charlemagne came up and violated her as well. Charlemagne was briefly arrested and eventually pleaded uh, to some charges that I think got him two years probation, but there was no DNA found. They could never prove that Charlemagne raped this woman. But he did plead guilty to some lesser charges at age 22 as related to a 15 year old girl. I think it has something to do with the delinquency of a minor. And I, th I think he had to acknowledge that, you know, plied her with alcohol and whatever else. But this woman kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing this. And eventually Kwame talked about it. And so I, I want you to think about the allegations and what Charlemagne has been accused of and what he pled to. Does that sound like someone who fits the profile of someone who would be ideal to work alongside Diddy and to be the face of the Breakfast Club and to be the person who mimics talking points that Diddy is supposed to get the entertainers that he works with and controls to, to talk about? D doesn't Charlemagne sound like someone who would fit right in at a Diddy freak off? Doesn't he? Is any, when, when you think about Charlemagne's history and what we know about Diddy now, and then you watch that interaction between Charlemagne, Diddy, talking about Joe Biden, let's, let's connect all the dots. Diddy is arguing, well, you know, Joe Biden's not perfect, but he's better than Trump. What types of things do we know about Joe Biden? Have we not seen constant videos of Joe Biden sniffing young children? Are, are there not allegations from Joe Biden's own daughter that he took showers with her as a young child? Did she not write this in her diary? Are, are, are there not suspicions that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden like inappropriate relationships with women? So you have Diddy, who's being called the Jeffrey Epstein of the music industry, talking about a presidential candidate, Joe Biden, who has his own sordid history as it relates to sex and, and women and young kids and just, whoo. 
He's Joe Biden is, you know, pro transgender and all that uh, sexual fluidity, all of that. Is Joe Biden not installing the, the transvestites in all these powerful positions? Is, is Joe Biden not clearly telling everybody that the transgender people are the people we got to protect and the whole LGBTQ and, and they're just the greatest and we got to do everything to protect them and sexual fluidity is important and your children need to be taught about it. And then you have Charlemagne with his history, with the allegations that were leveled against him in 2001. Doesn't that sound like a lot of synergy, a lot of interesting coincidence that these three guys would all be in alignment and would all be pumping the same message. And so you have to start thinking about what are Charlemagne's qualifications for being the gatekeeper and the leader of, of political discussions and uh, conversations about American culture for young black people. What are his qualifications? Is, is there some amazing college degree that he has? Did he write some incredible, thoughtful, profound book? Was he some incredible journalist at some point? What are his qualifications? How did he get installed? Why did he get installed? Kwame Brown was right about all of this stuff years ago. His instincts were right. He didn't have all the perfect uh, uh, statements and information, but his instincts were incredible. These are bad people installed for a specific purpose. And even when you're, because I believe Steph Curry is a good person, but he's naive, he's greedy, and he's been given F me money. And so he has to do what they tell him to do. Because he, he's not willing to make any sacrifice. He's not willing to say, nah, that ain't me. I'm not doing that. I don't need any more money. I got F you money. I'm good. No, he's greedy. He wants more money. He's an egomaniac like a lot of these athletes because they're worship. Well, you know, I grew up out in the suburbs, two parents. I don't know anything about uh, growing up poor and in the projects in Chicago, but I'm going to executive produce this cartoon about it. Th that's an ego out of control. It's no different than LeBron James. I am going to do this talk show, The Shop, and I know I barely have a command of the English language. I know that my thoughts aren't very profound. I know that I only read the first page of, of any book that I uh, claim to read. I know I'm not that smart, but yeah, I'm going to host a talk show and interview people and pretend like I'm a thought leader. I'm, I'm going to be more than just an athlete. No, LeBron, you're just an athlete. Steph, you're just an athlete. I'm not saying that to denigrate you. Play your position. When they move you out of position, they're moving you out of position for a specific purpose that has nothing to do with the upliftment of black people. It has nothing to do with the upliftment of American or of young people. You're just pieces on a chessboard that are being moved around to promote nihilism. you've all been installed. Stephen A. Smith, this dude, had to repeat the fourth grade, has said on record that a counselor in high school laughed at the thought of him going to college. He's lying about his Winston-Salem State basketball career. He's lied about his Winston-Salem State journalism career. He's lied about virtually everything that comes out of his mouth. The only thing, I'll give Stephen Smith credit for this. They gave him a thesaurus and they expanded his vocabulary. That is it. He's an idiot. He says what he's told to say. He's been installed. They gave him F me money and he has accepted it while pretending that he has F you money and while pretending that he's some sort of independent voice. Charlemagne. No qualifications installed as the voice of young people, given 
F you money that's really F me money. Steph Curry, great little jump shooter. They rigged up the whole NBA to make it so that he can be a dominant player. And again, I'm not, I like Steph Curry. And I, I actually like watching him play basketball. But thought leader, someone with a pair, a man willing to draw a line in the sand and say, nah, I'm good. He ain't that. He's been installed. We'll talk about this uh, with Kwame Brown. Let him take a victory lap uh, about all of this uh, in just a second. The last thing I want to do before we get to Kwame Brown, and it's good to have Kwame uh, back on the show. Uh, I want to remind you guys to go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. You need to be joining us here in Nashville, Tennessee for Roll Call 2.0. It's Saturday, June the 1st. Friday, we'll have some special VIP events on Friday, May 31st. Uh, go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com to reserve your spot today. Uh, the ticket prices are going to elevate starting next week because I'm going to be making some additional announcement about who's all coming and the entertainment and the speakers and, and the VIP events. Prices going up. You want to secure your spot now before Monday. Uh, Roll Call 2.0 is going to be amazing. John Rich has partnered with me on this, this music festival, food festival, conversation festival. Uh, Glenn Beck is going to be a great dynamic speaker. Mark Robinson, uh, Vince Everett Ellison, E.W. Jackson, Anthony Walker, Tim Floyd, King Randall's coming in from Albany, Georgia. I got more to tell you about next week. Go sign up for tickets right now. FearlessArmyRollCall.com. Kwame Brown, next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the most high. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Welcome back. I've been wanting to reconnect with Kwame Brown uh, for the past several months. 
Uh, this conversation today is the perfect opportunity. Kwame Brown, of course, the number one overall draft pick of the 2001 draft, a YouTube star, Kwame Brown Bus Life 2.0. You guys should check him out there. He's been on the program before. Glad to have him back because, Kwame, I've been thinking about you ever since I read Stephen A's book, his memoir. And when I read it, some of the things you said two or three years ago really, really made sense to me that were a tiny bit confusing when you said it two or three years ago. You made an accusation <laughs> that David Stern and the NBA had basically installed Stephen A to pass off a certain message about you and the NBA. And when I heard that originally, I was like, that's interesting, but I, I don't fully follow it. And then I read his book, and then Cat Williams said what he said, and virtually everything you said now makes perfect sense to me. Th these guys get installed. I think you've been completely vindicated. When I read Stephen A's book, I'm like, this guy has no qualifications to be talking sports. He's lied about himself. He's a pathological liar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, do you feel that vindication now that people have a better understanding of Stephen A. Smith and now that people have heard from Cat Williams? Let me show you where I'm at, uh, Jason, and show the crowd. I'm over here chilling, living my best life. Ever since Cat Williams came out and said what he said, I, I felt vindicated because uh, most times it's the it's sometimes it be the right message, wrong messenger, and um, a lot of times I think the way I said it, people thought that oh he's just angry, he's just bitter, and uh, now that I got it out in that manner because I've been disrespected for so long, there's no need to get it out in that manner. I've made my point about our culture, the music industry, that you shouldn't care about an NBA player cursing if you're going to send. Uh, Gorilla and Cardi B and all these women to the White House uh, once they talk about their WAP and their, and their booty hole brown and those things that they're using, they use our celebrities to push a narrative. And Stephen A. Smith, uh, I come from the old school. If I can't read, I can't diss somebody who can read. That just doesn't make any common sense. Uh, if I can't if I can't play basketball, I'm not going to say it in a way that's going to offend somebody who can play basketball. Of course, everybody can have their own opinion. But when you look at how much money uh, uh, McDonald's All-American bring to a college, and we had, I think, in, the t in my draft class, we had at least three or four high school players in the top five of their class. In the top five picks, there was three high school players. And I think that whole draft, it might have been like 13 players. And it was going to increasingly get more and more and more. And uh, just like Nick Saban, Nick Saban pulled his head out, uh, his, uh, his hat out the race. Because uh, the only reason why I would go to an Alabama opposed to an HBCU or a different school is because of the credibility that an Alabama would give me in the NBA. Um, there's a couple of basketball programs that I know if I go through that in the NBA it's going to be more favorable for me because I'm with a more of a go-along, get-along game. I can go to Kentucky, Ohio State, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia, anywhere in Florida. Those are going to be Michigan. Those are going to be schools that's going to allow other coaches that's going to might want to play me or or things of that nature. So it it all fits. It's all about the politics, like. Uh, this NBA game is just all politics. I don't fit in any of their narrative. I'm saying that a poor boy whose dad was in prison, whose mom was on welfare, this my story is supposed to be a story that resonates throughout all the inner cities. Uh, by all definition, my, <laughs> I'm, I'm like one of one. Um, but they tell the story in such a disrespectful way because they don't want the average everyday kid to think that they can make it despite their circumstance. And if you listen to what I said when I first got drafted, 
like it's in chronological order of why they did what they did to me. Because as soon as I got drafted, I said, every anybody can do this. If I can do it, you can do it. Literally, I just got shot at right before I, I went up there and gave my speech. I got shot at because my brother got in my car. We was headed to play basketball. Some dude shot the back window out because of something happened with him and my brother. So I lived such a urban lifestyle and made it to the NBA that to me it was it was easy to do. I did this all while working at McDonald's. I had a job at Mitchell's Construction at 14. And I do believe because my mother wouldn't fit the narrative of your dad is the angry black man in prison and you're this uh, black woman who came in and saved the day and got your black son to the NBA. I believe once she wouldn't push that narrative, that's when, if you look at it, every news story about me is negative. Here it is. I got a 3.0 GPA at the Glen Academy High School that you can look up. But some lady named Sally Jenkins that I sat down with for 30 minutes said, I'm the dumbest guy in the world. And they went with this story. And every story you hear about me, they, they give it to you in sound bites to make sure people keep this narrative that he's some uh, got lucky uh, a black kid who's ignorant, who who uh, needs help from and, and assistance from everybody. And that's not the case. This whole time, this 14 year old kid has been helping his mama in the right way. I saw through learned behavior that, hey, every kid is going to help mama. And this is why I think society engineered this single mama uh, catastrophe. Every little boy is going to help mama in a good way or a bad way. I'm not going to watch mama struggle. If I got to steal from you, rob you, whatever, that's my mama. And it's the brainwashing that they give us. And my mom understood that. Half of my brothers went to prison because my mother couldn't take care of us the way that she used to when she was connected to my father. Now, my father ultimately made the mistake and did what he did because my mother was a stay-at-home mom. And so once the sins of the father kicked in, that, that ruined the whole family structure. So when we were a unit, none of this was happening. And in every black household, you have this scenario, this setup, where the mom is like a godlike character. She can do no wrong. And anything a man do is wrong. And I'm telling you, that breeds that breeds a melting pot of disaster because I'm one of eight. And out of seven boys, almost all of them been to prison except two. And and that's that those are those are terrible numbers. When you look at what they like to do in the media, they like to uplift LeBron. They like to uplift Kevin Durant. They like to uplift great basketball players who came from a single mother. But if you look at the percentages and the numbers, this is no knock on women. This is not an ideal situation. And even though I've created several of those situations, I recognize that I was wrong. Kwame. I'm wondering when you started this conversation two or three years ago, I can't remember, or maybe it was even four years ago, I can't remember. Were you aware of what a pathological liar Stephen A. Smith was? That his Winston Salem State basketball career was a lie? And then I read the book so that you don't have to, but, but you're absolutely right in terms of Stephen A. Smith has written a narrative that contra in his book that contradicts what he used to say about his father years ago, before he wrote the book, he celebrated his father. He writes a book and takes a major dump on his father and celebrates mm -hmm. his mother. He played to the narrative. Again, you can go find interviews in the early 2000s where he celebrated his father, had nothing mm -hmm. bad to say. Then he comes with a book and his father's a piece of garbage and his mother's the end all be all. It's all a fictional narrative, including the basketball career at Winston-Salem State. Were you aware mm -hmm. of any of this years ago when you when you came out and went on the offensive? No, sir. I mean, that's why I said it uh, out loud amongst everyone, because I knew somebody like yourself and everybody else who has good journalism skills you know, I knew you guys were going to be able to put the pieces in place. But um, when they create a guy like Stephen A, 
Do you know how much money he's helping uh, sports agencies and, and NBA teams, NFL teams? Do you know how much money this one person is saving these teams? Because he gets on a megaphone. And here's another thing. I thought we had a narrative that there was never a reason to put your hands on a woman. How is it that Stephen A. Smith can say that he's friends with a white male that put his hands on a woman and never in a million years would Stephen A. be able to say a black man is his friend that hit a black woman? He would never be able to do that. So why is he allowed to stand next to a man that hit a woman in Dana White? That's the power dynamics of a uh, 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 Dana White, and and <laughs> you've asked a pertinent question, and obviously there is a double standard, and there are levels to this. I'm not justifying it, but you, you've raised a pertinent question, and and you're a thousand percent right. He he couldn't stand next to, or when he did try to at some point add a little context of like, hey. Let's be careful of our provocation. He ended up getting suspended and, and shut completely down and nearly lost his job, but he yeah. can defend Dana White and keep his job. You, you, you raise an excellent point. Did you have any suspicions? Or I just wanna, and I know you've already said no, but I just wanna re-ask this. Did you have any suspicions that his basketball career at Winston-Salem State was made up. Did you suspect oh, no, I, that I, I, at I all? knew all of that was fake. I, I didn't know to the extent. Like, I didn't know he was going to lie like this, but I looked up Tyson Chandler. Like, I come from the basketball world, so anybody who played basketball, I knew Tyson Chandler when he was in the seventh grade, eighth grade. There was articles written about him, Eddie Curry, so all top basketball players you would know. Um, but they had more information out there when I came up. But even back then, there was newspaper clippings of guys like Stephen A. You can't find, I, I couldn't find anything on Stephen A anywhere about basketball. And I just found it ironic. And when I heard that he was going to high schools and colleges to tell them what a trash player I was, I said, that doesn't make any sense. Why would high school and college age kids need to know what, how bad or good of a player I am? What, how does that tie into anything? And when, anytime you look at anything you want to understand, you just follow the money. Is there a, is there a benefit for NBA players, black males, to not be able to come out of high school? And who benefits from it? I want to move on to a second level where you've been uh, proven right. Uh, Charlemagne the fraud, or Charlemagne the <laughs> installed, as I like to call him. I think this Diddy thing is very, very messy for Charlemagne. Let's let's mm -hmm. think it through. For and I've already explained this at the top of the show, but uh, so Diddy sex trafficking, hosting parties where young girls are allegedly being exploited, huh? So in two thousand and one, Charlemagne. A 15-year-old girl accused him of hosting or being involved in a party. Alleged, she claims she was drugged, taken upstairs by two men, and that Charlemagne was a part of this. Charlemagne pleads, uh, pleads out and gets, I think, two years probation. There's no DNA, can't prove he raped anybody. But doesn't that behavior sound very similar to the things P. Diddy's being accused of, and guess who Revolt TV and, and Diddy throw their money and weight behind? A Charlemagne the Fraud, a guy with a compromised background. And so the question I was asking at the top of the show, we've heard 50 Cent say, Diddy likes to take men shopping. Do you think Charlemagne told Diddy no when he said, let's go shopping? Do you think Charlemagne said no w when he was throwing those parties? You think Charlemagne was like, hey, man, this is crazy. What are y'all doing with these underage girls at these parties? Or do you think Charlemagne was go along, get along, and fit the profile? 
I think Charlemagne 100%, in my opinion, go along to get along. They need guys like that. And what they do is once they know that you're that type of guy, they you would think they would kick you out. No, they empower you and put you over a sector of black dudes. If you follow Charlemagne the God, Charlemagne has been empowered to help other black content creators all around YouTube space and all over. Um, I would name a few shows that he's connected to. You know, one is All of Smoke. Uh, two is the 85 South show, uh, allegedly. But there's several shows. If you take a deep dive, Charlemagne is the reason why they exist. So what that does is they're going to look the other way. Uh, I said this three years ago. I said, there's some people in this world that they put in place. They're like guys walking on earth. They help so much. They look philanthropic. They look like they just do no wrong. But they just do that so you can look the other way from what they're really doing. And uh, this is a cold game. In the world, mostly what's really going on is that when you speak truth like I, like I speak, I worry about my daughters. I worry about the women that's around me because the world that I understand, the men try to conquer you through women. So they'll tinker with your daughters, your baby mamas. Like, I don't. I don't care nothing about my baby mom. They're grown. But they'll they'll try to get into your family in any kind of way that they can to get you to shut up. And uh, I, I don't think people really understand how much uh, they're vulnerable and the people around them are when you speak the truth. But if they yeah, do some I research on... Do some research on what podcast that Charlemagne directly involved with helping, and then you can see the reason why he can do what he does in the black community and no one says anything. Well, you may have to text me that name so I can fill in the gap uh, <laughs> when, you're, when you're off air, because I, I want to know. I, obviously, I know he's involved with all the smoke. That's what mm -hmm. pops into my head. Uh, immediately, two, two but I'm that, sure there's two guys that run around the black community. That one acts like he's an activist, but uh, he'll direct black men to attack you if you offend him or upset him. He will never do that to a white man. Uh, another black man that will spit in another black man's face and always try to assault a black man, even though now we've seen that he'll go and try to assault a teenager. But you would think uh, Charlemagne would speak up against those guys to remember. Uh, when we went back and forth, the first thing he said is, I may have snapped. So it's looking like uh, it's the other way around. Yeah, I, I obviously, I've never liked Charlemagne. I don't think he has any qualifications for the position he's been put in. He's been put in that position because he's compromised and easy to control. Mm -hmm. we, we, we played the clip earlier, but I want to replay it again. I think, tell me if we have the clip of Diddy and Charlemagne talking about uh, Donald Trump. L let, let's play that clip. If this man is elected, we're not standing by no more getting killed. We're not scared of anybody standing up and standing by. We're on the verge of a, a race war. White men like Trump need to be banished. That way of thinking, it's real dangerous. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, we don't have no choice. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can say what you want about Biden. I, I, I can't say I love the pick either, but hey, we got to get him in office mm -hmm. and then we got to hold him accountable. So we saw Charlemagne, we saw Joe Biden come on Charlemagne's show and say, you ain't black if you don't vote for me. Charlemagne said nothing. He, this isn't a defense of Trump. This is a defense of like, Hey, there's a set of people trying to control what we do, take away our freedom to make choices any direction they want to go. Asian people, Latino people, white people, Irish people, Italian people, Jewish people, they can vote for whoever they want to. But us, we have to vote a certain way and we have to go along. And there's allegations again with Diddy. We know the allegations. With Joe Biden, we know the allegations. He, he sure likes to sniff kids. His daughter has said he took showers with her when she was, when she was a child. And here's Charlemagne, the third leg of that. He, in 2001, 15-year-old girl, allegations, he's arrested. He pleads down to some lesser charges. The whole thing just looks like a sex cult 
a pedophile sex cult. And if you're not involved in that, you can't be empowered. I mean, that's what it seems like to me. Um, uh, Carcino for life, shout out to Carcino. He talked about um, who all own the, who all controls the music industry. And uh, I will have to say on that part, Kanye was right. Everybody from who's anything in music is white. Uh, and then Carcino added another part to it. They're white and a part of the LGBT community. So is that the reason why they have most of the women so hypersexual? Because that's not going to lead to relationships. And they have most of the men extra effeminate because it's confusing. I'm not, I didn't grow up with men that wore purses. If you were a man, you didn't do that. If you identified as something else, you did that, but not as a not saying that you're a heterosexual man and still doing things that women do. So that's where all the confusion come from. I was wondering why is our music, we had one or two artists that did what they did, but now all of our music is trash. I can't sit in the car with my daughters and listen to the radio because they're humming the words. And I, I know they understand what the real words are. Just because you blurt out, you blurt out one little part, they know what the real words are. And it's just making these kids hypersexual. I don't get it. Last part of this on just a different level, and this is where I started the show today, is, is I like Steph Curry. I like Dale Curry. I certainly, I, I'm, I hope I can say this without being inappropriate, but I, I really like Steph Curry's mother. Uh, and so I, I like his whole story. But to see him being used to justify this Good Times cartoon that you're not old enough to remember the show Good Times. Maybe you watched it in reruns, but it was a big part yeah, of my childhood. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great show about black family struggling in the hood. It, 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 was, it was an uplifting, powerful show. And to see it distorted into this cartoon that celebrates all this negativity and uh, puts at the forefront, and then they use a basketball player as the executive producer along with Norman Lear, who's now passed with his production company, and, and Seth McFarlane. And it just looks like Steph is being used to justify how white people want to portray black people. And, and again, this is where I'm like, they're installing Steph, a basketball player, into a lane television production that I just don't see other white athletes executive producing TV shows about white culture or any culture, but, but they keep doing it with our basketball players or our prominent athletes. It, it just, this is another way the system installs because if they install, if someone with some chops or some, uh, experience in the television lane or someone like Bill Cosby, and I know that he's a curse word now, but just look at how he put the Cosby show together to be a positive force that did all those great TV ratings. And if they put someone like that in charge, they can't produce what they just got uh, Steph Curry to sign off on. I, I, I just, basketball players are blessed now making so much money. I just wonder what do you think about them dabbling in all of these media and television and movie projects and, and the way they're being used, in my opinion? Well, we're in trouble because, like you said, our vote is just for it, they made it like our vote is like a black agenda for the Democrats. Um, I said it three years ago that a, a celebrity is just a distraction. It's just so that they can handle the optics of the things that they're going to say. Um, they will. That's why they had a Stephen Jackson always talking about a Kwame Brown seven years, eight years, ten years after he's removed from the game because it, it gets views, it gets hits. So Steve, Stephen Curry, he brings a large uh, kid, a young following. Um, he's he's very popular. They're going to overlook the imagery of what's really going on because of Steph. They're going to laugh. They're going to say it's just a joke. We're just trolling. The, one of the worst words that they created was trolling. Because now a young man or a, a, a young woman 
don't have to stand on their actions or their behavior. They were just in character. They were just trolling. So you can never, okay, so when does trolling stop and when are you serious about what you're saying? And Steph Curry, just like you said, I was I was young and watching, I'm older than Steph Curry, but even I watched the reruns of Good Time. So, but I understand it more. I come from that type of era. Steph Curry, no offense. I mean, he grew up with a father in the NBA. Um, he grew up affluent. Uh, he's not going to see the serious nature of what it's really saying. Steph Curry can, he's not going to fit the description. Everybody knows Steph Curry. And he's fair skinned, so he's going to di- get a different treatment than me at seven foot. And for the first time, somebody is seeing the image. I come from that image. And not all of us are like that. So it's, it's a little bit offensive. Like, I didn't control the area code and the zip code they dropped me off in. The state controlled that. So there's a lot of kids like myself that despite if it's your family or your cousins, whoever, you're just surviving your environment because you were placed in this environment. And so to paint everybody with that type of brush to me is offensive. But what do you do? You just keep winning. You know, that's my thing. I, I'm not arguing with him. I, I, I hope and I don't want to offend Steph Curry, but I hope he take a deeper look at, like you said, how much money is important to you. Um, you make enough money. I think he got enough money that he could ever need. So how much is it to you for some white folks to hide behind your name to push a negative agenda? Because that's exactly what they're doing. They do it to all these guys. Kwame, I'm going to give you one last thing before I let you go. But I, I, I said this last week uh, when I was talking about Diddy and hip hop, and I, I talked about Dr. Dre, 50 Cent, and Snoop Dogg went on Jimmy Kimmel's show and participated in a skit where they were all examining Jimmy Kimmel's penis. And, and the question I had for them is the, yeah, you gotta, you gotta see <laughs> <laughs> they pretending to be doctors and they're all they're taking microscopes, binoculars, magnifying glasses to examine Jimmy Kimmel's penis. And the question I, I'm asking all these guys and I'm asking Steph Curry and I, I'm just asking, like, we love to talk about F you money. But but F you money is supposed to mean that, like, there's a point where you be like, nah, I ain't going to do that. I got enough money. I just ain't going to do that. And so it's like, Dr. Dre, you a billionaire. And you in your 50s, you got kids. Nah, I ain't gonna come on national TV and pretend like I'm looking for Jimmy Kimmel's penis. Nah, I'm Steph Curry. I got a, I got F you money. I, I'm, I'm not going to put my name on some cartoon, blah, blah, blah. And so what I'm arguing is with these celebrities, there is no F you money. What they give you is F me money. That means mm-hmm. they get to screw you Anytime they want. So yep. no F you money. They give you money so they can tell you, hey, I need you to bend over here and go look at Jimmy Kimmel's penis. And nobody ever says no. <laughs> Golly. Uh, I mean, you, you are definitely 100 percent right in a sense. It could because the money that they give is is for them to do certain things in order for them to continue making that kind of money because a lot of these guys let's cut to the quick they're more they want to look down on people um it's a lot of these guys that make 40 50 80 thousand dollars a month that's not good enough because that's not going to get them to the the cool kids club it's more about this go along get along game the parties the atmosphere all that that's more about what they want than just the money because there's a lot of guys making money that'll do anything to be a part of that little group and to be able to be on the yachts and to be around the Jay-Z's and uh, the Beyonce's. There's a certain type of element that, that you get around when you do these type of things. And it's, it, I wish I could say it was just about money. And most of the uh, athletes, and, and myself included, what we don't do is we don't really have to you money because our money is still coming from the beast. Our money is coming from them. They don't go and put their money into buildings, and I, I didn't because we, we give our money to banks, and banks are not designed to give us our money back. So, But instead, these guys control uh, $2, 3000000 million every two weeks. 
they can literally buy up their whole city. You would never need to sit down and put your fish in the air if you own the whole city. But instead, we'll put our money in the stock market and have uh, Johnny come lately that they gave a title, invest in hundreds and thousands of dollars of your money every single month. And you, you just get a slip of a bond or a dividend or whatever else. And when you're done playing, all of that goes away. Instead of going out and buying these hotels and businesses like all the other players are doing that are not black. They don't have to worry about uh, going to take their clothes off because they own two or three buildings in, in different states. They own commercial real estate. They, they own Bitcoin. So they're not going to bend and do things because when they get the power, they go out and create more money off of the money that they're getting so that they get the respect. The reason why they don't respect us they could just stop our check, and they know we're going to go broke in a couple of months. There's the NBA players right now currently, you stop their check, and they could be getting $30 million a year. Stop their check for six months and watch what happens. Kwame, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, people criticize me for at the, when you three, four years ago when you were going off, I was like, this dude's important. He's not saying everything perfectly, but this dude's instincts are incredible and what he's actually standing for and how he's uh, uh, moving the Overton window, widening the Overton window, allowing us to talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about. It's all important. And now to come back three, four years later and to see you completely vindicated, I actually feel good. And it, just like I told you the first time we had you on, I could care. I, you know, if I ever do something wrong and Kwame wants to criticize me, it ain't gonna change another a word I think about Kwame Brown. Your boy Carcinio, I know he likes to criticize me. Uh, Carcinio, oh, keep going at it, brother. Head, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep going, Carcinio. I couldn't care I less. Y'all need to have as a conversation because I think y'all wits will match up well. I think y'all should have a conversation. Yeah, he needs to let it go, but I couldn't care less. As long as his instincts are good and he's trying to promote something positive, I couldn't care less. I'm just not that important. Uh, so yeah. thank you, Kwame. Enjoy the rest appreciate of your vacation. It. Thanks for making the time for us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, that's you. Yep, uh, that is Kwame Brown. It's so good to have him on. Uh, that's tomorrow, and that means we'll see you tomorrow. Freedom, look for a breakout, feeling like a stand off, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just wanna have freedom. Sitting on a corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving. And all the when we all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just want, I wanna be I just want